today, we have the uh, privilege of having Dr. Yvette. Um, he's the director of our liver cancer program, which, as you all know, is one of the, if not the most, uh, you know, largest and most prolific uh, programs um, country in the world. And so he's going to talk to us today about some advanced information system therapies. Thank you very much. Thanks for this introduction. So, I will uh, try to walk you through uh, the current management of HCC at advanced stages and also what's going on in terms of discovery of new uh, drivers and in terms of new trial design. So here you have the outline of my presentation. Um, in terms of epidemiology, you are very familiar with that uh, liver cancer is six most common cancer globally. Nowadays, 750,000 new cases, and it is estimated that by 2030, there will be around 1 million new cases globally. Uh, the distribution uh, breakdown is uh, uh, outlined here, mostly Eastern Asia, 570,000. Japan, where the incidence is decreasing because the population is aging, and as a result of that, the incidence uh, is, is decreasing. <coughs> um, uh, years ago, the median age in Japan was uh, 65, and now is around 76 year old, uh, the median age of patients with HCC. We have Europe with a steady, steady state. There is no increase or decrease. It's, it's around 70,000. And in the U.S. is increasing. Um, is the second uh, leading cause of cancer-related mortality, and in cirrhotic patients is the leading cause of death. So here you have the incidence according to a uh, geographical area, and I want to highlight what has happened in, in North America, that uh, 15 years ago we have an incidence between three to five cases per 100,000 inhabitants in, in males, and now we are around at uh, uh, 10 cases per 100,000 inhabitants, that is more or less the incidence in southern uh, Europe. This slide, a busy one, tries to summarize um, the, <coughs> the main uh, risk factors for HCC development, and I choose one country <coughs> as an example. So the most important risk factor this is hepatitis B virus infection that accounts for 54% of HCC cases. And I choose China because it's the country with the highest number of patients, almost half of the global uh, incidence of HCC in terms of number of patients occurs in China. And the prevalence of hepatitis B virus infection in China is 9%. Globally, around 400 million uh, people are uh, infected. Joseph, what about the Delta? Well, certainly we are studying that at this point. We have uh, here a collaboration with the hospital in Ulaanbaatar, and we were able to gather around 200 samples. Um, among these samples, the, the highest uh, risk factor, well, the, the, the most prevalent <coughs> risk factor was hepatitis B delta co-infection. So among the Bs, 90% are co-infected with delta in Mongolia, and now currently Mark is here in my lab studying that. Uh, what we are seeing as a preliminary data is that uh, it seems that in Mongolia in general there is a higher number of mutations in general per megabase in the DNA compared to uh, Western countries and also compared to China. And it, it's not related, it seems, to Delta because when we're comparing B delta and B, the number of mutations are, are similar. So we need to understand if if the delta, the super infection of delta, is a is a cofactor in terms of progression of cirrhosis for sure. But in terms of oncogenic role, we, we don't know at this point what is the role of delta. Eventually in Mongolia maybe another unknown factor. And let's see if by doing in genomic analysis we can figure out. But Mongolia is the country globally with the highest incidence of HCC with close to 80 cases per 100,000. There is B delta, also there is C there, it's very prevalent, and alcohol as well. 
So hepatitis C is the second cause, the number one in the US, by the way, and the second cause globally, 30% of the cases. I choose uh, Egypt here just because <coughs> the prevalence of hep C in Egypt is 14% of the population. Then alcohol is the third cause of HCC, very prevalent, particularly in rural areas of, of France and northern Spain. And in the US, the fastest growing uh, cause of HCC is national alcoholic steatopatitis related to metabolic syndrome, obesity, and diabetes. As you know, 35% of the population in the US is obese, and as a result of that, some of them will develop NASH and HCC. The, the incidence of uh, HCC in NASH, it seems that in cirrhotic patients is around 1%, but certainly it seems that the percentage of patients non cirrhotic is higher than in the hepatitis C virus infection. Probably is around 30% of the patients do not have cirrhosis, 30 to 40, as opposed to in hepatitis C, that most of them, 90% uh, 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 of them, have cirrhosis. But do they have advanced fibrosis or do they? No, they, they, they may have F1, F2 as well. So it's not that they have F3. So in, in hepatitis C virus infection related to HCC, if they don't have cirrhosis, <coughs> most of them have F3. Of course, there are cases also F1, F2 in FC, but not so many. But in NICE, it's, it's more prevalent. Yeah, and then that, so sorry. What do you mean by age standardized as opposed to race? So this is the... the how, do you, what, how do you measure that by age standard? The agents are not yeah. uh, no, I think, well, I think that they are, no, I don't know exactly the math behind that, but I think they are adjusting because uh, no, because probably the they, they, the, the, the infants are out. With the prevalence would be in an older age group. Exactly. Right? So how do you standardize that to all the different populations? Because that's probably an important factor that's not. Mentioned. No, I would, I would say that the incidence is, is described in, adults in general. So if the incidence was in, in patients, let's say, above 50, probably will be higher. But certainly the, the <coughs> infants are out here in terms of counting the, 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 the incidence. Tatiana, we just saw F1, F0 to F1 NASH ACC yesterday. Mm -hmm. With an AFP of 2600. Oh. 65, I think. Well, no, 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 let's move ahead. Yeah, owns a lot of restaurants. <laughs> <laughs> so molecular molecular drivers. So this is the, the, the most common path for HCC coming from cirrhosis. Uh, in, in principle, uh, patients develop low-grade dysplastic nodules and then high-grade dysplastic nodules early. HCC, then large tumors, multinodular disseminated disease. Uh, in, at, at the level of low grade and high grade, uh, there should be probably there are several hits there that we don't know of, but we know some of the hits that are called gatekeepers. So it means that they happen there, do not suffice to develop HCC, but are already there. The most uh, common one is ter promoter mutations, 20, 25% of the patients. And then there are uh, common number variations as well in terms of amplifications of 1Q, 8Q, and so on. And then there is a second hit uh, with, a, with a driver that if it cures at the onset of the disease is called trunk driver. And the most prevalent mutations in HCC, in fact, are trunk drivers are occurring at the beginning of the, at the onset of the disease. And here you have the... I will list those uh, later on, but P53, beta catenin, uh, you have added 1A, uh, added 1B, you have um, the most common rotations, also amplifications, focal level amplification of PAGA and MIC, anomozygous deletions, uh, uh, P16, and, and so on. Then, so once the, the cell already have these mutations, th these mutations, um, are uh, also occurring in the dissemination of the disease in the metastatic points, but at this point, additional hits may, may occur, certainly as a result of treatments that, that, that produce a pressure in the cells, but also as a result of hypoxia or other, other circumstances. 
So the most uh, prevalent mutations in HCC are listed here in this paper that we published in 2015. So TERC is the most common, 60%, and here you have beta P53, albumin, and so on. And then at a level of 10%, there is this long tail uh, of mutations. Some of them are drugable, but most of them are undrugable. The number of mutations per tumor are around uh, 40 mutations per tumor in HCC. So it's in between of these high prevalent, so tumors hypermutated, mostly colorectal with MSI, or long uh, or melanoma. And on the other side, we have the pediatric tumors, a liquid tumor with, with uh, t less than 10 mutations per, per tumor. Unfortunately, the most common mutations in HCC are undrugable, and this has halted a bit uh, uh, the success of precision uh, oncology in, in this disease. Here is a, the first meta-analysis we conducted with 928 samples. And again, drugable, undrugable. Overall, 25% of the tumors have at least one drugable target when we analyze throughout the spectrum. And if in one slide I had to summarize the, the molecular classification after several studies will be proliferation class 50% origin. Uh, we have here uh, cells with progenitor-like phenotype that either may come from stem cells or are adult hepatocytes that de-differentiate expressing some progenitor markers. And then here you have enrichment for these gene signatures, EPCAM, S2, and so on, notch signaling, and so on and so forth. Another subclass is the hepatocyte-like uh, subclass within the proliferation dominated by TGF-beta signaling and wind signaling. And also very common in the proliferation subclass are the master uh, drivers in cancer, RAS, MED, IKT, and so on. The non-proliferation uh, class uh, has been less characterized. Mostly the most uh, critical uh, subgroup is the, uh, dominated by mutations in beta catenin HCC is one of the tumors with the highest prevalence of beta catenin mutations, around 25. So hepatoblastoma has 75, but not so many tumors have beta catenin mutations. So we can describe uh, and have been characterized, pretty, have been able to characterize pretty well these three uh, subclasses, and they are correlated also with worse outcome, the, the proliferation subclass, better outcome, the non-proliferation subclass. In terms of uh, management now, yeah. Let's talk a bit about the overview. This slide summarizes uh, the last 30 years of, of research. In blue, you have the natural history of the disease uh, for these five stages. Uh, the survival at early stages is, is, without treatment is around 36 months, uh, intermediate 16 months, and uh, advanced six months. And then with resection, transplant, and local ablation, uh, we are moving that to 60 months as a median, but certainly, for instance, with, with transplant, we have now submitted to SLD and have a plenary session, an abstract with transplant in HCC, led by Parisa here. Median survival is 10 years with transplant nowadays. Uh, and with resection, local ablation, you do not achieve that. You achieve between 60, 70 months median survival. Then, key embolization, 26, 30 months. Uh, in advance, we have sorafenib, blembatinib uh, beyond one year, and rego, cabo, and ramucirumab also uh, below one year in second line. And in red, I would say that are the major uh, unmet needs, certainly adjuvant therapy after resection local ablation. All the trials have been negative. TACE, still, uh, we are using TACE as a standard of care of intermediate after 15 years that the stage is established. We established that in 2003. And nowadays, it still is the only effective treatment in intermediate, so we need to improve that. And certainly, there are <coughs> other treatments that need to be applied, particularly combinations with immunotherapy. In one slide, which are the treatments and the evidence of that? Evidence here, high level, means uh, randomized controlled trials, meta-analysis of full data. Moderate means phase two studies. Low means... Uh, uh, Use the old-fashioned laser. Okay, this works always. Right? <laughs> so, so then I was saying that on the other, in this axis, you have the recommendations of the panel. These were the guidelines I was um, chair here or panelists in this one. And then a strong recommendation, weak or strong 
non recommended. So here you have adjuvant after resection, local ablation, 15 trials, all of them negative, chemotherapy negative, hormonal compounds, amoxifrin negative, Y90, two trials negative against sorafenib. Uh, 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 then in, in the other side, you have sorafenib, lembatinib in front line, positive phase three, rego, cabo, ramo, positive phase three, chemobilization, meta analysis positive. Radio frequency, uh, randomized trials positive. And then you have at this level of evidence, here we have nivolumab, and we'll talk about that based on phase two, but the phase three trial is negative. And then we have resection local ablation, a macrowave ablation. And then at the lowest level, we have external beam uh, uh, ablation therapies and, and others. So this is the staging system, just very briefly, for early stages we have ablation, resection and transplant at intermediate chemomobilization. I'm going to focus on the management of advanced disease with systemic therapies. This is the, uh, uh, the well-known profile of sorafenib, multikinase inhibitor, dirty molecule blocking 40 kinases, IC50s at, at the nanomolar level, uh, the seminal trial that still uh, based on this trial, 2008, still is the standard of care for frontline, has only been challenged by lembatinib. I will show you this data, but there is no drug superior to sorafenib so far in frontline. This is the meta-analysis of the two phase three trials, SHARP and Asia-Pacific, 827 patients, just to show you that patients with hepatitis B virus infection respond significantly better to sorafenib, median survival of around 14 months in frontline. <coughs> What happened after sorafenib? These are the main trials. As you can see, there have been sorafenib and four additional trials positive. All the other trials have been negative in the adjuvant setting. I mentioned 15, but these are the main ones. Sorafenib versus placebo, non-effective retinoids also. And here in front line, you have uh, sorafenib plus a lottery combination negative, and then all the other drugs, ribonib, sunitinib, linifonib, have been uh, negative. Also, Y90 versus sorafenib, two negative trials, and now recently nivolumab in second line. We have Ramu, Rego, Cabo positive, and the other negative. So I will try now to walk you through all this data. Lembatinib has been the only drug that has been able to challenge sorafenib in front line. Here you have, uh, very briefly, the, the, the main targets. So the novelty of lembatinib is that it's blocking BHGF receptor 1, 2, 3, 4. And as you know, for instance, for BHGF receptor 4, there is a clear overexpression of FGF19 ligand in HCC that, uh, that it's an oncogene, and this has been shown in several experimental models. And it's blocking very thoroughly FGF receptor 4 and also all the other receptors, along with BHGF, uh, red, CKID, and, and platelet-derived. This study was designed with a... Uh, to watch, first watch for superiority, lembatinib versus sorafenib, second watch for non-inferiority. Therefore, the study was powered for non-inferiority, and this means that if the first watch was negative for superiority, they were enabled to run a second statistical analysis that was the one that was successful. Median survival, 13.6 uh, months for lembatinib, 12.3 uh, months for sorafenib, hit the non-inferiority, you can see that it is a very good overlap of, of the curve and there were no statistical significance. So the, inter the, the confidence interval is crossing the 1, as you can see with the ratio 0 0.92, but is below 1.08 that is established by FDA for DOC approval in HCC for non-inferiority. Interestingly enough, in the subgroup analysis, it seems that works uh, particularly well for patients with macrovascular invasion, high AFP, and hepatitis B virus infection. It's interesting because, I mean, this is based only on, on, on subgroup analysis, but uh, sorafenib is working better in patients with liver-only disease and EPC, whereas lembatinib is working better with EPB and extrapatic spread aggressive disease and high AFP. So this may help you also in the decision-making. So... I just mentioned lembatinib front line. As you can see, the 95% confidence interval is crossing the one. So in order to be superior, this should be finished here, the upper boundary, and it's crossing the one, but below 1.08. So this is the window of opportunity for non-inferiority. 
Conversely, here I'm showing, for instance, because there has been a lot of push in the US and mm -hmm. certainly in Europe with mm -hmm. Y90 to challenge Sorafnik. And, and, and you can see the has a ratio at 112, 115, and the 95% confidence interval is far beyond the upper boundary of non inferiority. So, in second line, what, what we had, we had negative trials. Brivari, Ramu, Tivantibi, and Everolimus, despite that, for instance, mTOR signaling is clearly um, uh, very pivotal in the development of HCC and the progression of the mm -hmm. disease. But Everolimus, in a non enriched trial, was negative. But you can see that the median survivals were quite similar to the placebo arms. So the first drug that hit the superiority versus placebo in second line was Rigorafenib. Here you, you can see the structure of sorafenib and the structure of regorafenib. And certainly the only main difference is the fluoride here. So, and as a result of that, has a different spectrum. So it's, it's very potent. Uh, it's much more potent to most of the targets of sorafenib. And on top of it is blocking type 2. This is the receptor of angiopoietin 2. This was the design of the trial, 2 to 1 rego versus placebo in patients that tolerate sorafenib. So there was a selection of the patients only. So in frontline, 15% of the patients do not tolerate sorafenib. So here, all the patients already had tolerated sorafenib. The results were uh, amazing in a sense that for a more potent drug, but similar with a clear overlap with sorafenib, for patients resistant to sorafenib, it worked uh, uh, pretty good with has a ratio of 0 0.63 and 10.6 month median survival versus 7.8. And the subgroup analysis in all subgroup of patients, including patients with extravagant spread or patients with high AFP, it works pretty well as well. The, there was a concern because of the toxicity of regorafenib in colorectal cancer in third line, in third line that uh, it's not pretty well tolerated, that this may uh, hamper the, the applicability of, of regorafenib in these patients. Here you have the profile, and surprisingly enough, the fact that the patients tolerate sorafenib make the, 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 the scenario in which regorafenib was performing pretty well despite of that, 10% of the patients, the drug was removed, was withdrawn as a result of adverse events. And I use, I'm using this as a courtesy of Porusia from Japan because in a, in a meeting in Japan, I like it very much. Why, why he explained the difference, why is better tolerated regular in HCC than in, in, in colorectal, very simply. So here you have uh, the patient receiving sorafne, hot spa, he said, then very hot spa with regular but still okay. Conversely, uh, directly third line regorafenib is too hot a spa, and therefore the patient intolerates regor. And I think, I mean, I think it was a way, a simple way to understand it. There have been a push to explain that patients with the sequence treatment sorafenib follower regorafenib have a median survival of 26 months. 26 months. So, if you are able to receive sorafenib, tolerate sorafenib, survive sorafenib, progress upon sorafenib, and then receive regorafenib, and also you tolerate uh, regorafenib, your expected survival may be around 26 months, understanding that if you are able to do that with sorafenib, and then you were randomized to placebo, your median survival was 10.2 months. So in reality, you are expanding seven months, but it's a way to, to see it. So that now that we are talking about, about advanced HCC, with these sequential treatments, the life expansion uh, goes beyond uh, or around, may go around two years. Well, so the results with Rego are putting this 10.6 for treatment at the control at the median of eight months. That is what is expected. Second trial, celestial, cabozantin. Cabozantin is also a multi-kinase inhibitor with the uniqueness that is blocking uh, MET signaling. And MET is activated in HCC, and it has been shown at least by gene signatures and by immunostaining and so on, that is activated in advance in 50% of the cases. Here you have the result in patients progressing to sorafenib as a ratio 0.76, and median survival 10.2 and 8.0. Also, interestingly enough, is working well in patients with extravatic disease, macrovascular invasion, and hepatitis B virus. Conversely, 
is not working very well in patients with hepatitis C virus. So these are also hints for you to understand how you can choose a, a drug in second line. Cabo in patients progressing to sorafenib eventually is not ideal if the patient is an hepatitis C virus infected uh, patient, as opposed to, for instance, Rego or Ramo, if he has a high FP. So Cabo, we have here Cabo and uh, Placebo. So it seems that the, there is a threshold for those patients that achieve uh, survivals beyond 10 months that may may uh, get a difference in survival, considering that the natural history is 8 months for placebo. Then we have the exception of, of REACH. REACH uh, was a trial comparing uh, ramucirumab versus placebo. Ramucirumab is a monoclonal antibody against BSGR receptor 2. The trial was negative, but in the subgroup analysis of REACH, only for patients with very aggressive tumors, defined by FP more than 400, you have ramucirumab 7.2, placebo 4.2. Note that the natural history, it should, it should be around eight months. And here we're talking about natural history of four months because of 400. So as a result of this, the company decided to run another trial only in reaching for high aggressive tumors. And here you have the REACH2 study, only in reach for that. And the trial was positive. 8.5, 7.3 has a ratio 0.71. So, uh, and, and then they run a meta-analysis of individual data of the two trials, and the final conclusion is 8.1 8 for ramucirumab in second line in patients with aggressive tumor. Natural history for these patients, uh, five months, has a ratio 0.69. And as a result of that, this drug also is in the armamentarium now. Here you have the three drugs with a positive trial for superiority versus placebo, so the upper boundaries are... Uh, below one in all of them. So what's the final conclusion on the management of advanced? We have sorafenib as a standard of care. We have lembatinib. Some hints are sorafenib for advanced liver only. It's better, FC better. Lembatinib for patients with aggressive tumors, FD or high FP. Then we have Revo, Cabo and Ramu that are effective. Ramu only in patients with FP more than 400 that represent 40% of the patients in second line. Regularly in patients that progress to sorafenib uh, and tolerate sorafenib. And in these patients has a very good hazard ratio. And then cabozantinib in all the other patients, considering that it's not very good for hepatitis C virus infection. Let's talk a bit about immunotherapies. You are familiar that this, this has been a sort of uh, a revolution in the management of cancer in general. Uh, responses now are around 20%, but in some tumors are going up to 50%, particularly to combinations. Here we have ipilimumab, the first approved, nivolumab, and then all these, all these drugs and the indications in which uh, they are approved. So this has uh, been uh, an outstanding revolution in, in, in oncology. What we have about our, the phase two data was published in Lancet, including 262 patients. Uh, either in front line or second line. Most of the patients were in second line. Objective response rate 16% and was not related with the status of hepatitis B or C or other etiologies. So response and tolerance does not depend, it's not related to the etiology. And then duration of response, that this is appealing and now we know that generally the median is expanded to beyond one year. Uh, this is completely different than TKIs, where duration of response is around four, six months. Here we have between nine and 12 months. Median survival was 16 months for these patients. I just mentioned that for frontline, we're talking about 12, 13 months. Second line, 10 months. Here we're talking about 16 months, so appealing as well. And then 20% uh, of the patients have uh, uh, immunostaining positive for PDL1, but unfortunately, this is not a market of response. Positive for PDL1, 26% objective response. Negative for PDL1, 19%. So PDL1, here it shows a trend, but certainly is very far from a positive uh, biomarker. And the authors uh, declare that baseline tumor biomarker status do not have an effect on response rate. So certainly what, of course, is a predictor of response of survival is complete response or partial response. Here we have 22 cases, <coughs> median survival. Uh, not not rich, certainly. As with patients with a stable disease, median survival 60 months. Patients with progressive disease that are more, around 50% of the patients have progressive disease. 
8.9 months, so it means that it's not changing at the natural history of the disease. So certainly there is a clear interest to identify <coughs> all of them, but particularly those patients that respond or that have primary resistance. So one of the efforts was to compare nivolumab versus serafinib in, in frontline, and this trial has been on for at least three years and a half. Uh, for, uh, the primary endpoint was uh, overall survival. 726 patients were randomized to nivolumab and serafinib. There was recently a press release by Bristol that was sponsoring the trial that the trial has been negative. And here you have the hazard ratio reported 0.85, 95% confidence interval crossing the 1, 1.02, p-value 0.075. We assume that this data will be presented at ESMO this year, um, but we don't know the, well, I, I know because I'm involved, but certainly we, it has not been disclosed, this, this data. Second trial, disappointing. <coughs> Pembrolizumab versus placebo. This is the last trial that in which it was ethical to randomize patients to placebo in second line, because at the time the trial was started, there was no second line therapy. But nowadays you have three drugs, Rego, Cabo, and Ramu in second line, so it's not ethical to run these trials anymore. Pembro versus best supportive care, placebo versus best supportive care. The, the data was disclosed at ASCO, 413 patients, 278 to Pembro, 135 to placebo. Has a ratio 0.78, 95% confidence interval not crossing the one, 0.99, p-value 0.23. So you said, okay, this trial is positive. It looks positive. And it turns out that the threshold for a positive trial was established at 0.017 because they they were very ambitious, very aggressive. They split the alpha. You see there are two pro-primary endpoints, progression-free survival and overall survival, and they have three interim analyses in between. So they spend the alpha there, and then the alpha for the final analysis was only on one side, 0.17. And therefore, is the first time that we have a drug that is clinically effective in a sense that uh, survival was uh, better, uh, significantly better in reality, but is statistically negative. And as a result of that, the drug uh, will not be approved. Uh, uh, well, we know that Pembro and Nibo are approved in second line based on, on phase two data, but uh, we, it will not be approved as a regular approval. And probably they are holding the, the withdrawal depending on what's happening in other trials that are run with the same design and they will merge the data and the meta-analysis. This has been a pity because certainly the data is there that the drug was effective. Objective response here was 17% versus 2%. And the duration of response in this trial, 13 months, which is a, a lot and is aligned with what we, what we know. Then how we therefore can identify, so why these trials are negative, but imagine that even if the trial would have been positive, well, a uh, hazard ratio 0.78, I mean, is not spectacular. We have regorafenib 0.63, cabozantinib 0.76, 0.71 ramu. Uh, also, uh, for nivo versus sorafenib 0.85. So it's not that it's spectacular, the results. So what is happening here, probably what is happening is that you have a huge effect in a small population, 20, 30% of the patients, and then in a, a very important percentage of population, 50, 60%, there is no effect at all. And therefore, it's very difficult to track the hazard ratio with this, with this uh, population. Therefore, uh, it is important to identify biomarkers predicting response to checkpoint inhibitors. So what we have at this point, approved by FDA, so here you have the type of biomarkers in which there is a favorable outcome associated with checkpoint inhibitors, but only two have been validated in phase three trials. PDL1 uh, expression in non-small cell lung cancer and uh, tumor mutation aborted also non-small cell lung cancer and also in, in melanoma, this has been, uh, these are positive predictive factors, so PDL1 expression and, and high uh, tumor mutational burden, and, and already are approved. This, you can measure that with immunostaining and, and here with 
this with target exon sequencing. But all the others, despite that there have been several publications uh, with positive prediction, still have not been validated in phase three uh, trials. So here is the tumor mutational algorithm. There is a correlation between uh, number of somatic mutations per megabase. You can see here the hypermutated tumors, uh, um, colorectal, uh, non-colorectal melanoma with 20, 30, 40 mutations per megabase. And then we have HCC here, around two to three mutations per megabase. And we don't know if this will predict, but it looks like that all these tumors in which they have been tested, the tumor mutation algorithm in phase three, there is no correlation with response. We here uh, in, in, in 2017, Daniela uh, was leading a study uh, identifying the immune class of HCC. Just very briefly, this uh, uh, represents 24 to 27% of, of the patients, and there is an enrichment for the immune scores, several immune scores that have been reported, uh, uh, enrichment with T cells, uh, macrophages, uh, uh, ter tertiary lymph node structures, uh, cy cytolytic to toxicity, and then these three genes, these two gene signatures of the monostaining of PDL1, and these gene signatures have been associated to response to checkpoint inhibitors. Um, also, certainly the immune class that represents 25%. And there was no association, association with the tumor mutation border and to neoantigens in our analysis. And this is very common for the majority of tumors, except this percentage with, uh, that are highly mutated tumors. But there was association, a significant association, as you can see here, with chromosomal instability. So the more chromosomal instability, the more excluded class, the less chromosomal instability, the more significant enrichment in the immune class. Also, another effort run here in the institution is the recent paper by uh, the group of Amaya, who have participated also in this study. Uh, we already uh, identified that there was association between beta catenin signaling and immune exclusion. And certainly in this study, they demonstrated that in uh, experimental models in HCC, beta catenin promoted immune escape which involve defective recruitment of dendritic cells and consequently impaired T cell activity. And, and therefore, uh, beta catenin was driving resistance to tumor. Here you have one example. The model includes uh, uh, the MIC uh, P53 uh, uh, hydrodynamic uh, uh, transfection uh, with, uh, um, with plasmids. And here you have the treatment with checkpoint inhibitors and the control, conversely. Uh, conversely, this doesn't happen with the uh, beta catenin mutated and me, in which there are no difference between uh, PDL1 treated and untreated animals. So our proposal of the molecular class and the characteristics is that there is an immune class in HCC that we define also the subclasses of active and exhausted. Exhausted is dominated by TCF beta signaling and activation in the stroma. And here you have the molecular pathways that are uh, related to the immune one. Uh, less chromosomal instability, uh, high immune infiltrate, kill structures and PD-1, PDL one immunostaining. And these patients might be the ones responding to checkpoint inhibitors. Then there is the intermediate class, and particularly the exclusion class in other studies. This is called immune uh, and desert. And here you have a decreasing number of T cells with beta catenin mutations, high chromosomal instability, and, and less uh, uh, structures and, and immune staining. And certainly, these are the tumors that might be primary resistance to checkpoint inhibitors. And therefore, the TKIs that are able to revert that, that are able to increase the immune infiltrate, that are able to decrease the T-Rex here, maybe the ones that are able to rescue these tumors for uh, adding checkpoint inhibitors. So we don't have data, uh, strong data to support that. So the only study is this a small study published in CCR 
by the memorial group in which in, in one of the subgroups they treat 27 patients with checkpoint inhibitors and, and they check the status of uh, win activation and certainly the patients with an increase in the tumor diameter after the treatment, meaning non-responding, were the patients with beta catenin mutations and axin one mutations. And as you can see, these patients uh, the, the, are the ones resistant with the one wing ulcer, uh, uh, are the ones resistant treated with checkpoint inhibitors, but treated with sulafenib, there were no differences. So then it comes the concept of combination, as I mentioned. So there is only 20, 25% 20 of patients responding. Then, therefore, what happens with the other 75? There may be primary resistance. And what's the role of the combinations? I'm here showing you two combinations, bevacizumab, atezolizumab, and the other combination will be lenvatinib, pembrolizumab. So the rationale for this combination Atezo has been shown to promote T-cell activation. Bevacizumab is known to normalize the tumor uh, uh, vasculature and increase T-cell infiltration and also decrease the activities on, of dendritic cells uh, and T-rex among other mechanisms. So what has been reported so far in 73 patients in frontline with this combination is that there is an objective response of 34 First, they reported in 25 patients objective response of 62, and they got a breakthrough designation by FDA. But now, it, it is getting a regression to the mean with 73 patients, 34% objective response according to modifiers, a median progression free of 14.9, which is outstanding, I have to say. And they are already moving and have completed the requirement of the phase three, comparing ATEZO. Uh, uh, plus uh, Beba versus Sorafenib. The other combination is the one that we're uh, somehow leading here along with uh, Mass General and UCLA. This is the combination with Lembatinib and Pembro. Uh, this is the report of last year, 24 patients. Now I'm presenting this data at ESMO with 100 patients, as you can see here. And so far we have confirmed 42% objective responses and I can tell you that the, the data looks very promising with 100 patients and we will disclose that almost this year and this has provided the rationale to design this phase 3 comparing Lemba Pendro versus Lemba in frontline HCC that also we will participate in this trial. Proof of concept uh, studies and precision oncology this is one of the final um, slides well I want to show this study because I think it's very interesting. This is the report of the first 10,000 patients accepted in memorial in which the tumor uh, got uh, uh, a sequencing with, with a platform uh, impact that uh, sequenced 500 genes or so. And here you have the, the prevalence across the tumor. The most prevalent mutated uh, uh, gene is P53. Uh, close to 40%, you have KRAS, therapy, A3K, BC, and so on and so forth. And then, this is very interesting for me, there are several levels of evidence when you have a mutation to understand if the patient will respond to the mutation or not. Of course, level one is that the FDA has recognized this biomarker, whatever the biomarker is, to, uh, uh, to respond to a, a drug that has been approved accordingly. No? For instance, amplification of vertonin breast cancer, approval of trastuzumab. This is a level one. Level two is the standard of care biomarker for an FDA approved drug in, in the same indication, and the level two B is in another indication. What I mean by that is that the strength of evidence is here you are approving a biomarker, here you are approving a drug, and then you are, you are checking the biomarker later on. But anyhow, what I meant is that with this study in which they accepted 10,000 patients, sequenced the tumors, they were able to provide treatment to 37% of the patients based on that, which is outstanding. And here you have the different levels of evidence. Of course, the strongest level of evidence, only 7%, but at the, at the level 2, additional 11%, so close to 20% of the patients with a very, very strong level of evidence that the drug that you are giving is, is making a difference. But overall, as a result of this sequencing, patients receive 
a drug accordingly in 37% of the cases. There are uh, this is a, a slide of 21 indications based on biomarkers that we are now beyond 35 indications. And this is a very interesting uh, concept that I want to show it to you to, to, to link the actual drug over target with mm -hmm. actual FDA approved drugs for this target. So with this bullet, uh, so with this uh, arrow, you have the compelling clinical evidence, but not yet standard of care. So this means that, for instance, for low grade glioblastoma, 85% of the low grade glioblastomas have a, a druggable target, 85%, or thyroid. Uh, 75%, but still, with this bullet, FDA has not approved any single drug. Whereas in the previous slide, I was showing all the action that you can take in a given hospital as a result of, of the mutation. Where is HCC in this scenario? We are here. When I was showing our data about a whole exome sequencing, I said, and the meta I said, that HCC has 25% of drug work. So 25% of the patients can receive uh, drugs, and here we have the 25%. In this scenario, it was 20%. But zero drugs approved so far based on that. So we need to at least fill this gap. And we have tried that in this effort that we published years ago, high-level amplification FGF19, 7%, but overexpression of FGF19 in the amplified Overexpression more than 100 fold change and 14 fold change in the others with with no with overexpression but no amplification. 25% of the patients with FGF with HCC have FGF19 overexpression, and this is already known as an oncogene based on uh, transgenic animal studies. The the company used PDX model to show the proof of concept. PDF, P, PDX model of patients with tumors with FGF19 amplification and overexpression. And in both models, as you can see, the response here and here, the response to treatment to this specific drug blocking FGF receptor 4 was outstanding. As a result of that, we conducted here a study. Here uh, I'm showing the drug. This is the kinome compared to regoracanib and soracanib, as you can see, these are very dirty molecules blocking a bunch of kinases. Here is very selective blocking FGF receptor 4. We designed this study in advanced HCC, mostly second line, immunostaining, we're detecting patients with overexpression of FGF19. This is not the ideal biomarker, I have to say. I think it's better messenger RNA, but anyhow, the company moved ahead mm -hmm. with that. And also include some patients with FGF19 negative. And here you have the, the response. With FGF19 positive, we have 16% uh, objective responses, 0% for FGF19 negative, which this represents a proof of concept. And now uh, we have submitted this uh, proof of concept to cancer discovery uh, a couple of months ago. Finally, so this is the overview of management. Just a couple of slides to uh, give you an idea about what's going on in trial design. So we are recommending randomized phase two in order to design phase three trials. Certainly, this is an academic recommendation because the companies are by no means following this path. Target population should be stratified by BCLC by child that uh, we're able to of the cases and by peak of performance status. The standard of care, so the control arm should be the standard of care. Since in H1 we don't have treatment, it is accepted placebo. Uh, in TACE should be, in intermediate, sorry, should be TACE. And now we are launching here a study, Lemba Prembro plus TACE versus TACE. And then combinations in first and second line, uh, all the options that I mentioned before are accepted. So as a control arm, in front line you can have Sorafenib or Lembatinib, and in second line, Rego, Cabo, or Pembro, according to the, the trials. Uh, the overall survival is the primary endpoint. Recurrent survival uh, is the secondary endpoint, and these are other endpoints. So it turns out that uh, here you have the list of trials, and uh, it turns out that now something is happening. So patients 
in the REFLECT trial, comparing lenvatinib versus sorafenib, they were randomized, and then when they are, were out of the study, 30% of the patients in the lenvatinib trial received sorafenib. So in reality, you were comparing sorafenib versus lenvatinib follower sorafenib in 30% of the patients. And this is a sort of bias. So now we know that in the phase 3 trials that are coming, 50% of the patients after progressing are receiving an, an efficacious drug afterwards. And this may mask the efficacy of the drugs that you are testing. So probably you need an endpoint that may be time to progression or progression free survival. So in order to understand that, we, we analyze the uh, time to progression, progression for survival and overall survival. And in order to make it short, this is the median survival of the patients. In order to make it short, we correlate the overall survival with progression for survival. And the, the, R, uh, the Spearman was quite good, 0 0.84. And it turns out that only those patients with a hazard ratio for progression free survival below 0.6 have a positive trial, celestial, reach to resource, and we calculated also the charge because the progression free was not there, we calculated that. So conversely, the trials that were negative have has a ratio for progression free survival be point, beyond this point. So we're recommending this has a ratio in case that the trial is designed for progression for, uh, for phase three with, with a front line that second and third lines can mask the results. So this is an accepted endpoint for FDA. Was discarded at the beginning because we had the competing risk because there were child B patients included. Now we only have child A. And as I mentioned, in Reflect already 30% of the patients were using drugs efficacious afterwards. In this study, good correlation, seven out of 21 randomized control trials have significant difference in progression free survival but only three show difference in os so something is happening we cannot accept progression free survival significant as an endpoint but with the cutoff of 0 0.6 uh, we think that uh, uh, progression free survival links to overall survival and increase in, in benefit and between 0 0.6 and 7 it is uncertain the impact so these are the conclusions so accepted in front line, lembatinic heat not inferiority accepted, rego accepted in second line only in patients progressing to sorafenib, cabo accepted in second line, particularly FB aggressive, ramu only in patients with FB more, more than 400. It's the first biomarker driven therapy, but in reality this biomarker indicates just aggressive tumors. If we, made, we published recently a very small study suggesting that there is BHGF activation, more activation, of the pathway in FB high, and this may explain why they respond to the Ramo. Nivo Pembro, FDA approved, but both trials have been negative. So let's see what happens with that. Combinations with a test of EVA 32, Lemba Pembro 42, and I think that now is the end of the testing of single agent in HCC. We're in a new uh, period in which uh, the, the the new uh, drugs coming will be combination therapies, both for advanced and also for intermediate. And in terms of endpoints, OS remains as the primary endpoint, but in case of considering progression free, we suggest that the magnitude of the benefit should be set up to be low as a ratio below 0 0.6. Thank you very much. I'm open for questions. <laughs> Yes. Uh, in the post transplant obviously very So first, what what data we have? So there was the silver trial comparing Everolimus versus placebo in 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 post transplant. And the trial was negative. So it was said that the, an mTOR inhibitor also can be used as an immunosuppressive drug. Uh, it has been negative. There are isolated uh, studies with sorafenib in which they claim that uh, it's also efficacious in, in that setting. And checkpoint inhibitors, I understand that might be eventually dangerous, have been isolated reports in which uh, it's uh, uh, inducing resection of the liver. Uh, but 
these are isolated reports, but I would say that this is not the ideal setting. Yes. It seemed to me that the first data demonstrated a checkpoint inhibited from more effective after serapin, suggesting that whenever serapin resistance is happening, it predisposes to response. It's been that way with chemotherapy as well in other tumors. So uh, wouldn't one want to have automatic bringing in the checkpoint inhibitor before you get resistant. And the other question I have, when you talk about progressive free and survival, is, the, is it the new metastasis, the new tumor that's coming up, and the one that you were originally finding and treating, that one may be responding, and does that suggest you've got a whole different bunch of drivers and mutations, and it almost means you have to biopsy it that one. Well, regarding the second one, uh, the progression-free survival is according to modified resist, so it's not only new metastasis, but also growth of the main tumor or interbatic dissemination. Everything is considered. And uh, what, what we know is that if the new, the, the lesion causing a progression is a novel metastasis or vascular invasion, then the outcome is worse. We know that. That if the progression is based on new lesion or vascular invasion, is worse. But the uh, hazard ratio refers to all types of, of progression. Regarding the first one, I'm not sure what you are saying that they respond better because. It seems to me when which the, the PD1 inhibitor yes. is used in patients that have Yes, no, it's, it's so. Uh, the PEMBRO trial, the objective response was 16% and in front line has been 15 to 20%. I'm on that second line. 16%. But in front line was 15 to 20. So there is, no, see, there is no much difference on that. Sort of a related question, actually. So with the combo therapies, uh, the, it seems the response seems to be much better. Yes. Is that because you're on a masking somatopose that is generating a bigger immune response to checkpoint inhibitors? Or we, well, well, in order to thoroughly answer this question, you have to take a biopsy at baseline and then biopsy later on and then compare what's going on. This has been done, for instance, with atezobevacizumab in, in renal cancer. And what they have identified is something that also we're identifying in animal models. What is studying that in animal models is that these uh, drugs, particularly lenvatinib or bevacizumab, but uh, in, in case of renal was bevacizumab, is able to increase the, the CD8 uh, immune infiltrate in the tumor and decrease the, the T-REC percentage. So the T-RECs are decreased and, and therefore the, you are removing one mechanism of immunosuppression. And as a result of that, I think you can rescue some tumors that were completely silent for, for the checkpoint inhibitors, you are rescuing those. But also can be an additive effect because, for instance, Lemba alone uh, achieved 24% uh, objective response. Okay. So, and then Pembro is 16. So you don't know exactly what is synergistic, what are you rescuing, uh, what is uh, just adding effect. So, thank you very much. Thanks.